It must be a very tedious debate. Okay? I think so. Because we feel we are good for something.
this up. Good morning. And uh, happy Mother's Day to all you moms and caregivers in the congregation. I hope that it, um, despite the slight gloom on the day, a little gloomy today, I did see sun yesterday, though. I don't know if you caught that. <clears throat> so it's still out there. So fear not. Uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Just a couple of prayer requests for you today. Um, bon Ann Stutler continues in the hospital, but seems to be doing better, so we're grateful for that. Dale Jacobson went home on Friday, pray, pray for his continued healing following uh, heart surgery. Uh, Judy Hausman asks us to pray for a friend of his, Frank, Frank Gandolfo, who's um, dealing with pneumonia right now. And then some good news to share with you as well. Um, Chris and Lindsay Reuter uh, have welcomed the arrival of their second child, also a daughter, like their older child, um, Brielle Taylor. So we're happy for that. And my nephew and his wife welcomed their daughter, uh, Emma Gale, on Friday. So we have some births to celebrate, as well as people to carry around in our hearts. So please remember to do that. And then just a, a brief heads up, uh, if you're following along and, and paying attention, the reading from Acts is going to be the sermon passage for today. And, and it's possible that the preacher might ask some questions about that. So here's what I'm saying. The, the sermon's on Acts and there will be a quiz. Okay. Are there other prayer requests that any of you have this morning? Anybody want to keep this going? Yes, happy 86th birthday for Michael today. 86th birthday. Wow.
reading from Acts 16, 16 to 34. One day, as we were going to a place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money for fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who will proclaim you the way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought him before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city, and they are Jews, and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, they put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. After midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to him. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone in chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he, exposed, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushing in. He fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, and you and your household. They, they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them, washed their wounds, then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. He and his entire household rejoiced.
to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with his testimony to the churches. I am the root and I am the root and the descendant of David and bright morning star. The spirit of the of the, the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let everyone who hears come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift, the one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen.
feels present when it's not Mother's Day. Right? You could do that, right? Because guess what the best gift they already have is? Anybody, can anybody guess what the best gift your mom's already have is? You, that's right, it's you guys. It's you guys. You are the best gift that God ever gave anybody, especially to your moms and dads. And did you know that God gave you a present too? Life? That's right. And your moms. Your moms are a really wonderful gift, aren't they? You think so? Sometimes one parent has to be a little stricter than the other. And it doesn't mean they don't love you. It just means that they're trying to make you go in the right direction. Right? That's a gift, too. What if they have different rules? That's a good question. That's, see, then you can distract them because if one of them, never mind. <laughs> to count the gifts that we have. Because too often I think what, what, um, what happens is that we start to look at the, the wrong stuff. We start to look at the, the overwhelming things. We start to look at the things that make us feel um, less, than, less than strong. Let's put it that way for now, just for now. Things that make us less than strong. Things that make us feel defeated even. And that's, that's kind of why I wanted to focus on the reading of Acts with you this morning. As you consider the characters in that brief story about Paul and Silas, can you help me to identify who in that story, and, and you're, feel free to take it out and read it again, I don't expect you to memorize the whole thing. Um, who in that story comes across as a victim? Who in that story comes across as a victim? Just anybody. Kim. 
Jalen, absolutely, right? He's about to kill himself. The reason he's about to do that is because if he let all those prisoners escape, he becomes liable for fulfilling their sentences, which means basically a life sentence for him. So rather than being a, uh, in prison himself, he's just going to get it over with. So yeah, good, the jailer. Who else? Who else is a victim in the story? Slave girl. The slave girl, right, the slave girl, who, who makes this wonderful proclamation, right? Takes one to know one. The slave girl says about Paul and Silas, oh, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Um, and then and she's by nature as a slave. She's a victim because she's owned by somebody else. Who else? Who else is a victim in the story? Don't be afraid to shout it out. <laughs> Paul and Silas. That's right. Very good. We might not think so at first glance because they seem to be the ones who are the most common in this, that whole situation. But they are victims. Initially, they're victims to the slave girl herself um, in a rather interesting way. Uh, Interesting insight, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, says that Paul was annoyed by this woman following them around day after day, saying, you guys are the slaves of the Most High God. And finally he got so angry, he turned around and said, just come out of her. Now this was not a compassionate healing. Paul was frustrated. When will this woman ever shut up? Is kind of what he was thinking in his head. So he casts the, uh, the spirit out of her because he's annoyed because they were victimized by her constant proclamation of who they were. That's how they felt about that. And then, of course, that victimization gets worse, right? Because they end up in prison. Um, unjustly, by the way. Unjustly. But that's part of another story. Who else? Who else is victimized in the story? Anybody else? The prisoners. That's right. The other prisoners. Obviously, been victimized whether it was because they deserved their punishment or not. They are in prison. And, and, and they are victimized by that imprisonment. Good. Who's that? The owners of the girl, that's right, very good. They lost their income, right? They lost their ability to make money off of this slave girl, and so they're now victimized by their loss of income. And that's the reason that they bring Paul and Silas before the authorities, because they've lost their, uh, their source of income, at least part of it, by the slave girl losing her gift of fortune telling. Right? So we have Paul and Silas, we have the slave girl, we have the other prisoners, we have the owners of the slave girl. Um, just about everybody, do you notice just about everybody in the story is a victim? We might also say, and I'll give you that second part of the story that doesn't occur in our reading for today, but we might also, also say that the magistrates are victims too, because what happens is, um, after this incident with the jailer and him, and him being baptized, um, the next day, the magistrates want to let Paul and Silas go. The, the civil authorities want to let Paul and Silas go after having them beaten. And Paul says, now just a minute. What you failed to take the time to find out before you had us beaten was that we are Roman citizens. And as Roman citizens, we have a right to a trial before punishment, which you all forgot about. So now you want to just let us go as if nothing happened. But we're not so willing to, let, to do that. Because you guys treated us badly. You guys did not follow the law. And so, so now the magistrates are like, okay, all right, just go. We made that mistake. And, and they become victims to their own um, willingness to go along with the crowd. Right? The crowd is saying, you know, these guys are making trouble, so they should be punished. And the magistrates don't take the time to think. They become victims to the crowd mentality that kind of overwhelms them. So we've just got this story where everywhere you look, People are victims. People are victims in one way or another. The second thing I'd like you to think about, though, as you consider all those various victims, is what do they do in response to that sense of being victims? What do they do in response to that sense of being victims? Now, I already mentioned that the magistrates, the civil authorities, try and cover it up. OK, just go. Leave. Go to another town. Uh, let's let's just keep this quiet because they could lose their job if they weren't doing it properly. So they they kind of they're looking for a cover up, right? <coughs> Trying to make it all go away. <coughs> the, uh, the, the the owners of the slave girl react with anger at their deprivation now of the source of their income. So because they feel victimized, they react with anger <coughs> at that. What about, um, what about the jailer? How does he react to this 
his uh, potential victimization. Anybody notice that? His initial reaction, as we already mentioned, his initial reaction is to want to kill himself. An understandable reaction. He's not being hysterical there. He's, he's reacting that way because of where he stands if all the prisoners have escaped. So we don't want to judge him for that. Um, rather, we want to be compassionate towards that sense of panic that he had. But then, then his response to being in this corner is to find a way out or to be given a way out. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. What's Paul and Silas's response to being victimized? You notice what happens around midnight? They want a trial. They want a trial. Yeah, well, they don't get it. But they, but they say, you know, you should have given us a trial. So part of their victimization is to say, you know, you guys messed up. Right. But what else do they do? I just see it as an opportunity. Because they could have left. They didn't. They could take that experience of victimization and they use it as an opportunity. Now let's just be careful here. We're going to come back to this. And I know what you're thinking now. Pastor said at least three things that we're going to come back to. And I have reservations at <laughs> noon for a really nice Mother's Day lunch. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll be the timekeeper. No pass. But around midnight, Luke tells us, Paul and Silas, who are unjustly in prison, are singing hymns. They're singing hymns. I just want you to think about that for a minute. If you were in their place, would you be singing hymns there at midnight? Probably not. I'm just guessing. All right, I'll speak for myself. I, I apologize for assuming anything about you. I'll speak for myself. I would probably not be singing hymns. I might be pacing back and forth, maybe mumbling under my breath about those lousy magistrates, about the crowds, about those selfish slave owners um, who, who can only think of themselves. I might be doing all that. I don't think I'd be singing hymns. I might be praying, God, why'd you let this happen to me? But probably not feeling about, probably not looking at opportunities or grace to break in here. But that's exactly what they do. And my, and my question to you is, to think about, I'm not putting you on the spot again. Why did they do that? Why, of all the people, so we have, just to recap for a minute here, so I can catch you all up and then we can move ahead a little bit. We have owners who react with anger and vindictiveness about losing their source of income. And notice who gets left out in that whole equation. The slave girl herself. We hear nothing more from her. Right? So we have owners who react with anger and vindictiveness about losing their source of income. We have magistrates who don't even take the time to do what they're supposed to and then try and cover up the whole situation. So get, get rid of it. We have a crowd who reacts out of impulse. We have a jailer who panics. And then we have Paul and Silas who seem to find a place of calm and peace and opportunity in the midst of their own victimization. So they kind of stand apart from everybody else. And my question to you is, why is that? And I have an answer of mine, and you may come up with one of your own. My answer is that the reason Paul and Silas take a whole different approach to their victimization is because they know that somehow as Karen said, God can use this as an opportunity to bring God's grace into the world rather than to perpetuate that cycle of, I've been hurt, so now I'm going to hurt you. So rather than keeping that cycle of victimization and violence going, Paul and Silas bring it to an end by looking at the whole situation differently because of their relationship to God. So because of what happens here, they're able to behave differently here, on this level. Which is so important. Because otherwise that whole cycle continues itself. And we see that in our world, don't we? I mean, you don't have to show me your hands, but if I ask you how many of you feel victimized by circumstance, or by the power of others, probably most of us at one time or another would raise our hand and say, oh, absolutely. 
Are you kidding me? It was just April 15th. I had to pay all these taxes. I've heard from a lot of people I had to pay all these taxes. You know, and where's the money going? You know, there's victimization right there. So many of us feel. Or if you've ever been pulled over because of a traffic infraction or something, um, you, you might feel victimized by that. It wasn't going that fast. I, I know that. Um, and on occasion when I was coming down the Taconic the other night, and man, some of those state troopers hide really well, <laughs> really well, right? And, uh, and I was just, it was, it was nighttime, it was dark, and I was just, I looked to my left, and there's a state trooper car. I'm like, holy oh, smoke, how fast am I going? And almost immediately in my head, as I noticed I was going slightly over the speed limit, and that's all I'm giving you, sisters and brothers. <laughs> I said to myself, I should be okay because other people are going faster than me, right? How many of you used, have, have used, at least in your head, if not actually to a police officer, that justification? There were other people going faster than me. So you're ready, right, with your excuse so that you don't get victimized. Now, victimization, not just in those mild ways, but in more serious ways, is a real concern and not to be downplayed. Many people in our world are, in fact, victims of circumstances and behavior beyond their control. And I want to focus for just a minute on that one small character who sets this whole sort of situation in motion in the Book of Acts, and that is the slave girl. There she is. She has this spirit of divination, whatever that means. She's able to tell people's futures. She's able to see things that other people aren't able to see. And she sees Paul and Silas, and immediately she picks up on the fact, because of the spirit in her, that these men are working for God. And she says quite boldly, they proclaim to you a way of salvation. They're telling you how to be saved. They're telling you how to not be a victim anymore. Isn't that ironic? Here's this woman who's a victim because she's owned to say, and these men are going to tell you how not to be a victim. They're going to tell you how to strengthen that relationship with God so all of this stuff doesn't seem as monumental. When Paul gets annoyed with her and casts out the spirit within her, we hear nothing more from her. Nothing more. That bothers me. Because she is the one who is most victimized. She's a woman. She's a slave. She has no rights. What happens after all of this? Do her owners give her a lower position in the household? Maybe before this they used to treat her well, and now they treat her like garbage because she's worthless to them? Do they sell her? We don't know. But it bothers me, and it ought to bother us that we hear nothing more about her. Because that's the situation of so many women in our world today who are victimized by circumstance, who have no rights, who have no voice. The story in Acts is very contemporary. The level of, of slavery of women in our world is perhaps greater than it has ever been. We just don't see it anymore. So God invites us, who are not victims, <coughs> I'm going to stop right there for just a minute because I might have let that go by too quickly. God invites us who are not victims to speak for the victimized. Here's what I, if, you know, if you get anything out of the sermon and, if, and if this, this has sunk into a meaningful level, you can raise your hand and if we get a majority, I'll stop right here, okay? <laughs> You are not victims. You are not victims. Sometimes life can be a pain in the neck and really make you feel like nobody cares, it's not worth it, and you can feel victimized, but because of this relationship that God has created with you in baptism, through Christ, because of God's love, you are not victims, ultimately. Now, that's not a qualification that makes everything else okay. That's a qualification that lets you know that because of God's deep love for you, you're okay, ultimately. And our goal as Christians 
as followers of Jesus, as people of faith, uh, as those who are conscious of that vertical relationship, our goal is to make that ultimate reality of non-victimization a current reality in our lives and for the lives of other people. Let me just say that one more time. Our responsibility, our calling, our gift as people of faith is to take that ultimate reality that we are not victims and bring it into our current reality, both for ourselves and for other people. That's our calling. That's our responsibility. That's our opportunity. But in order to do that, we have to be more conscious of what this means, this vertical relationship means for us, so that we might sing hymns and praise God at the worst of moments. So that we might remember that God is for us, that God loves us, and that everything that we experience, God knows. And that God doesn't always take it away, at least not right now. But that God is about the work of bringing healing to God's people and invites us into that work as well. Paul and Silas, well, let me just, we don't know much about Silas, but we know a lot about Paul. And perhaps the reason that Paul finds such, um, such grace and, and patience in, in the midst of his suffering is that he's got nothing to lose, right? He's got nothing to lose. He, he used to have his life all figured out until one day he was going along in that path that he had set for himself. And Jesus came along and knocked him upside the head and said, Paul, what are you doing? It's wrong. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you bringing my people to be killed? And Paul's like, who the heck are you? And Jesus says to him, I'm Jesus. And this, this really throws Paul for a loop. He's like, there is no Jesus. You died. Why are you standing there talking to me? And Paul's life gets totally turned around. And now, if, if anything, he becomes victimized by God's love, which, which changes him. Now remind me to tell you a little bit of a punchline later on. We've covered all the other later ons, just in case you're keeping track. But this one we have to come back to. And, and let's take a bit, of a, a bit of a diversion right here for a moment. It's, it's little known, there's a missing, missing passage in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where... Um, after, after Cain gets jealous of his brother Abel and kills him, we hear about Adam and Eve's grief, and Eve says to Adam, she says, kids these days. Kids these days. You ever hear that, kids these days? You ever get that? People saying it behind your back. Let me just tell you, really, people saying it behind your back, kids these days. Sometimes we as parents have said that, kids these days. People have always said, kids these days. Just so you know. Because every generation has this opportunity to make your own mark in the world. And, and please, seize that opportunity. It is why God has put you on earth. So that you can make your own mark and help us to be better human beings. Because you have this great deal of enthusiasm and sense of potential that we need to remember. And when we don't like being reminded of that, because sometimes, all right, I gotta speak for myself again. Sometimes we slightly older people, right? We forget what it was like to be a kid. And we want to keep everything nice and smooth, and then you come along with your radical ideas and you shake us up a little bit. It's a good thing, but our response is, oh, kids these days. Whenever somebody says that about you, take that as a compliment, okay? Because it means you're making your mark, you're stepping out, you're being different. That's a good thing. What got y'all to be who you are? You know y'all, I sometimes slip into Southern, though I was never Southern. I saw this little, uh, I think I told you about this before. How to speak Southern, one person is you, Two, um, two to three, two to four people is you all, y'all, and five and above is all y'all. So, 
So I'm addressing this sermon to all y'all, right? Um, what we need to remember is that in, as, as we think that we've got it all figured out, that's at the very moment when God is, is ready to shake it up. So here it is Mother's Day. Moms, you've done a great job. You've done a great job. Don't let the circumstances change your mind about that. Right? You raise kids to be independent, express their own selves, and sometimes that means going against what you think is right. That's part of the process. It's a tough job. It's a tough job to be a mom. And the thing is, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, but you're finding it out. It never ends, does it? You never stop being a mom, do you? You never like hang it up. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> On Wednesday, my mom will be 90 years old. 90. Yes, I was a late in life baby, in case you're doing the math. <laughs> Not that late. <laughs> she still worries about me. That job never ends. I'm like, Mom, you don't have to worry about me. I'm 58 years old. You know what she says? You're still my son. Right? You probably all said that at one point. You're still my son, you're still my daughter. But you've done a great job because some, I don't know, maybe I, I shouldn't speak, right? I shouldn't speak, right, guys? I'm coming over here. That means you have to wake up. Here we are paying attention. I was going to make this assumption that probably was not a fair assumption that your parents love you, but maybe you don't feel that way. But but would you would you say that you're pretty sure, like like 75 and 100 percent sure that your parents love you? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Is that all they need to do? That pretty much is all they need to do, I think. And if you know that, like if you know that, that means you've done a good job. You can rest easy. A little bit. I mean, you don't have to be so anxious about being parents because you've done a good job. And I'm only pointing to these guys because they have the misfortune of sitting in the front pew today. Mm -hmm. Right? Thank you, Waco, for giving me a captive audience. <laughs> and you guys, too. Do you guys know that your parents love you? You pretty sure about that? Good, good. How about the rest of you kids? You know your parents love you. I hope you know that in a way that is really deep, even though sometimes they make you angry, they love you, and, and then parents, you've done your job. Moms, you've done your job. You've brought them into the world. You've gotten them to this point, and I know you're not quitting anytime soon, but the challenge for you is to not feel victimized by kids these days or the many frustrations and things that happen, but to continue to strengthen that relationship here by strengthening this relationship here. By being good moms and dads, even though it's Mother's Day, dads too, because God has given you the ability to love these children into health and happiness, and also holiness. So, let me just sum all this up, and then we'll continue our time of worship. Too often, too often, Life can make us feel like victims. And probably we are. Sometimes. Maybe not as often as we think. The question is not whether or not you've been a victim. The question is what you do with that sense. And you can either collapse under it, get angry about it, be vindictive about it, be bitter, get depressed, or like the example that Paul and Silas give us, you can remember that God is still with you. And maybe sing a hymn or mumble a prayer, or pray for help, or find some help, come worship. It's what you do with that victimization. <laughs> this same Paul, as he's being taken away to Rome as a prisoner, <laughs> And what we suspect happened to Paul was that when he got to Rome and got that trial that he wanted, he was condemned to death for being a rabble-rouser and preaching this new religion. 
But this same Paul writes to those Romans as he's on their way, on his way there, he says, I believe that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now you would expect Paul to be collapsing under the weight of victimization, and instead he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For, he says, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God poured into our lives through Christ Jesus. The next time you feel like a victim, remember that you are more than a conqueror, that nothing can separate you from God's love. And in that spirit of overcoming, of being a victor and not a victim, share that good news with others. Work as hard as you possibly can to help others who are victimized to realize that they too are more than conquerors. Because that's God's promise. And it's on that hope and that reality that we live and love and find strength in our relationships. God calls you conquerors. Nobody can take that away. Amen. All right.
Now let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 104 in the red hymn notes, in the pew cards on the racks, and in our minds and hearts. We believe in one God, Father Pray for the life of the church, the lives of people in need, and the life of all creation. God of renewal, fill us to overflowing with the grace we receive in word, in water, in the meal. Draw others to join the life we share in your church. Hear us, O God. Declare your righteousness through the blossoming of creation. By the winds blowing and birds singing, inspire us to join in the hymn of all creation. Hear us, O God. Be the source of all strength and peace for people who see themselves as victims and for those who are imprisoned in mind, body, and spirit. Renew them with the overwhelming power of your salvation and give them release for their spirits, making them feel like conquerors. Hear us, O God. Reveal yourself to those who feel isolated because of illness, grief, distance from loved ones, status, or the prejudice of others. We pray especially for Joan, Shirley, Frank, Von Ann, Dale, for all those on our prayer list, those serving in our military, and for the family of Jack Bellotto. Comfort and welcome them into your spirit-filled community. Hear us, O oh God. We thank you for our mothers, and we ask that you bless all those who serve in a mothering role for others. Send your spirit to those who mourn, who have not known their mothers, or who long to be a mother. Hear us, O oh God. We thank you for birthdays and new births, and ask that you bless Michael and all those celebrating birthdays this week. Bless. Brielle Taylor Reuter and Emma Gail Eggensteiner, their parents. May they grow together in love to honor and glorify you always. Hear us, O oh God. You draw all the saints into your presence. Draw us into the mystery and wonder of your presence until Christ comes again. Hear us, O oh God. We deliver all this into your care, O oh God, trusting in the work of your Holy Spirit to bring all things into the risen life of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. And share the peace with one Thank you. 
betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. Broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. forward to receive this gift with us this morning, the gift of Christ himself, the strengthening of our life of faith. The ushers will direct you forward. I will place a bread in your hand, the words the body of Christ given for you. You may then either drink directly from the chalice, or you may drink from the individual cups. There's white grape juice or red wine in the But however you choose to receive, please know that this invitation comes from God to you.
to leave here. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you make your home with us, bringing heaven to earth in this holy meal. Fill us with your spirit as we go from here, that we may wipe away tears, tend to those in mourning and pain, seek the healing of the nations, and bring to earth the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Good to see you all today. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the congregation. Happy birthday, Miguel. Bell's beautiful job. Nice job, everybody. Thank you so much. Just a couple of really quick announcements from me. First of all, thank you to Rebecca Bell for putting the flowers on the altar in memory of her mom, um, so newly uh, arrived in heaven, and of all mothers, in honor of all moms. We do have fellowship downstairs. I know it's a little bit late. I apologize for that, but I hopefully gave you a lot to chew on over the next week, right? So, all right, no more of that. Um, <laughs> next Sunday, the celebration continues with the day of Pentecost, our first communion for, certain, for some of our young people, as well as welcoming in of new members. So if you'd like to join Emmanuel, speak to me. Please do come out and celebrate First Communion. Last class is this Wednesday at 3.45 for uh, those who will be receiving First Communion on Sunday. Um, I just have a quick, I want to read a note for to you from Heather Peterson, a former member of our congregation. She says, it's been a long time since I've visited or been in touch, but I still consider Emmanuel home. They're delighted to share the good news that they're blessed with two healthy children, Ruthie and Archie, who is six weeks old. Um, they said we attend St. John, St. Matthew, Magna, and Brooklyn, and have found a second family, but we miss you all. So I wanted to share that with you. Other than that, congratulations to Alana Kent, who yesterday was elected vice president of the Lutheran Youth Organization in our Metropolitan York City. So congratulations, Alana. <laughs> else that needs to be shared with the congregation? Yes, sir. We're going to sing for Michael, right? We're going to sing for Michael. Okay, we are. <laughs> Can I sing a little? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
such a long age, <laughs> but I guess uh, our genes are such. My mother died in 95, so you have to take care of me until get 95. <laughs> Congratulations. You carry it well. You carry it well. Yes, Mikey. Now may the blessing of the Lord God Almighty, the blessing of Christ the Lamb who was slain and rose to life, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit of truth be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Sending him is number 482. Amen.